ahead and find your seats really quick. Uh, remember, if you have a question, remember, if, if you have a question, um, if you don't want to wait for the mic, please speak up because we have a translator. Uh, if you have a question in Spanish, uh, James is fluent in Spanish, so go ahead and ask the question. He'll translate it in English uh, for those that don't speak Spanish, so if, if you're comfortable just speaking Spanish, go right ahead and do so. Um, but at this time, I'm going to go ahead and bring in James Harris, so that way he can discuss conservatorships. Thanks. Thank you very much. Just a second, I'll get this... Uh So just a matter of uh, introduction, uh, my name is James Harris, but only my mother and judges call me that. Um, <laughs> and both times it feels like I'm in a little bit of trouble, so well, you just call me Jimmy. My friends call me Jimmy, and I uh, like to think that at least by the end of the night you'll either hate me and just call me James, or you'll call me Jimmy because you like me. Hopefully it's the last. Um, I am the father of seven, seven children, three are adopted, or four are adopted, I can't even keep track of them. Um, five of those children uh, have been or are on IEPs. Our oldest son, David, who's 25, uh, was diagnosed with, uh, with Asperger's. Uh, we couldn't figure out why he was super smart and could figure things out, but was super clueless with people um, until someone said, hey, have you ever had him tested? And my wife and I went, for what? Thank you. And uh, about seven years old, he was diagnosed with, with Asperger's. He struggled through school. We we did the whole IEP thing, 504s, just had no idea what we were doing. It's really a rough road. My heart goes out to anyone who has been or is there or is looking to it. Uh, like I said, we have four other children, uh, one who has some autistic-like behaviors. Um, so my, my, uh, my heart really is in the special needs community. My mom was a special education teacher growing up. Um, my youngest brother had Down with autism. Uh, I'm certified. And I worked in the school system. I've seen this from the parent point of view, from a school district employee. As uh, and myself, I I have uh, processing issues. Uh, have ADD, ADHD, really bad, uh, and anxiety that goes along with it. I about flunked out of law school my very first year. And when I started working at the special education law firm that I interned at, they're like, "Dude, you got to get tested, bro." I went for what? And they went, "You're a hot mess." And I did, and lots of things came about from that. Um, ended up doing actually really well the last two years, but uh, it really brought to light the struggles that people go through. So I, I, I like to think that I bring a different perspective to these things. What I, uh, what uh, Mr. Martinez asked me to speak to you guys today about and I'm, I'm happy to do is about making sense of limited conservatorships. Again, my name is Jimmy Harris. My law firm is Southern California Law Office. Can you, it doesn't look like you can see. Is it blurry? No. Okay. You're, you're just, your eyes are going out of warranty. So I thought about it when when I was putting this presentation together, I've done a few of these conservatorships, and I thought, what are, what is it that, that, that we have to ask ourselves? How do we prepare for this? What, what are they? And um, that 
top question really drove home the point of what a conservatorship does. And you have to ask yourself whether your child is ready to make adult decisions independently. I've got quote unquote typically developing adult children. I don't think I can answer yes to that. But I can't get them a conservatorship because there's certain things that they have to qualify for. Um, so some of the, the sub questions of that, do you believe that their disability limits um, their capacity to make those decisions and are they susceptible to undue influence? And undue influence is where you have a person who is susceptible to being tricked and there's a likelihood that it would happen. So it's, it's, it shows that part of the law that it's to protect those who, who need that, that extra help. And it helps you be able to, as you'll, you'll learn or you already know, uh, it gives you an opportunity to keep supporting your child and, and letting them grow at the same time. Um, for all intents and purposes, when I say conservatorship tonight, I'm talking about a limited conservatorship. There's three different kinds or types. Uh, the first is a conservatorship of the person, and then there's a conservatorship of a state, and then a limited conservatorship. The first two are typically for people who are physically incapacitated or because of their age are unable to take care of themselves. If at any point you guys have questions, make a comment, or I say something wrong, raise your hand. I'm not, a, I'm not above being corrected. So if we break this down a little bit further, in order to make sense of this, we kind of have to go step by step. Um, and the first is, is it's, sometimes it's difficult to understand who the players are in a, in a, in a conservatorship. Uh, so we'll go through that. And then what, what is a conservatorship? What does that mean? Um, I was speaking to Linda earlier, and we all hear these words thrown around, and it's like, oh, conservatorship, conservatorship. And we all go, uh-huh. But it's kind of like a unicorn. We've all heard about it, but nobody's seen one. <laughs> and, and we've all seen the movie, and it's like, is this real? So we'll, we'll discuss that. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about why a person would need a conservatorship. And when is it time to initiate a conservatorship? And what are the general steps? We're not going to get into the, the nitty gritty details of exact little pieces, but generally, what does it take to establish a limited conservator conservatorship? So first, let's talk about the, the people, the players. Um, right at the top, you have the conservatee, the conservator, a probate judge, attorney, and court investigator. Who are they? Do any of these surprise you guys? What about that? Who's the attorney for? For the conservator. Yeah. The, conservat the conservatee is going to have an attorney. And if, if the family can't afford one, or the conservator does not have funds to hire one, the court will appoint one. Um, it's, a, it's a simple process of filing a, a fee waiver, and nine times out of ten, they'll grant that. And they have uh, probate attorneys who volunteer a certain amount of hours every year. And uh, they, they, we, we get paid a, a very small portion of what we normally would make just to give back to those families with children with disabilities so that they have representation. But 
when I speak to you guys about attorney, I'm speaking about the attorney for the conservator or for the parents or whoever's going to be the, the caregiver of that child. Um, and the one thing when, when I started looking into conservatorships was there's a court investigator. And I uh, thought that's, uh, that's pretty cool. But I didn't know why it was cool until I really got into it. So this is uh, a little bit more of what they do. And you can read that, right, Ray? How about now? There we go. Um, you know, the conservatee is the person that needs the help, the disabled adult. And, and, it, and it's important to have both of those pieces, that they have a developmental disability and they're an adult. And kind of their responsibility is to be open to the idea that the, the conservator will be helping them to develop more skills like they've been doing probably their whole life. The conservator is a big job, and, and I know Linda is a conservator, um, my mother was a conservator, my younger brother, and it is a lot of work, um, because typically developing children at 18, you can be like Sia, you're, you're responsible for yourself now. But as a conservator, some of those responsibilities carry with you, and it's part of a legal, legally binding document that holds you responsible for them. The probate judge is the balance point. A lot of us think about, uh, or at least I have, uh, previous to entering the, the, the practice of law, judges are these people up there that know everything. They're the smartest person in the room. <coughs> um, there's a joke in law school that says the A students become professors, law professors. The B students become personal injury attorneys. And the C students become judges because they're not smart enough to not. Because you get up in front of a group of people and you don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of the law. So the attorneys and the investigators help supply the information to the judge so that they can make a decision that's in the best interest of the state, but through the eyes of the conservatee, while protecting the interests of the conservator. So they're, they have to take all that information and they have to make a decision that, that will affect the lives of several people, but primarily the conservator and the conservatee immediately. <coughs> The court investigator typically is a, is a social worker. Sometimes they're a regional center representative, but they go and they gather information from all the places so they can supply that to the judge. So everything that happens, just like the chart, all the information funnels to the middle, to the probate judge, so that that probate judge can make a, a final ruling and issue a, a a letter of conservatorship that encompasses what, what the, um, the disabled adult needs. Any questions up to this point? Andrew, what happens if typically the conservator is going to be a parent, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the life expectancy of the parent is going to go before the child. What happens after that? Does the state take over or takes over that conservator for the conservative? That's a, that's a very question. The question was what happens when, uh, if the conservator passes away, is there a plan in place? You can put a plan in place, and it's very simple. You can put it in a will. You can put it in a trust. You can have a, a co-conservator with you. That way, if one becomes incapacitated, the other can take over. You go to court. You file the amendment. And the judge either approves it or not. Worst case scenario is that if there is nobody in place or nobody foreseeable or there's someone who doesn't want to, there's not anyone who wants to, then the court will appoint one. But they won't leave someone who needs to be conserved 
out on their own. Either way, if you um, Re repeat the question, you mean the the question was is whether or not the co-conservator is appointed at the initial stage, or if they're brought in later in the process. And the answer is either one. Um, for example, in my situation with my wife, I'm I'm fairly sure that we'll both be we'll be co-conservators of our daughter Willow who, happy birthday, shout out to Willow, 17 years old today. Um, she's a firecracker. If you ever just want to see a, a great big bundle of joy, she is a Westview cheerleader, a Westview Wolverine football and basketball cheerleader, and she brings more joy into our lives than sometimes we can handle. Um, but those are, those are really good questions. Uh, Anyways, back to, like, my wife and I will probably be co-conservators. However, if there's one parent who is gone all the time working, they travel for work, the other parent probably would be the conservator. If, for some reason, that other parent comes back and they're either working close to home and they're home more, or they retire, then you go to court and you just file and they make sure that you're good and they bring you in as a co-conservator. The, the other way is, is through the will to protect the interests of that child so that if something happened to both, you have a backup backup plan. Any other questions? Sweet. So this one's really hard to see on purpose. That, that's actually on purpose. Because that's how confusing, when you get into law, it, they make you study for three years. You don't learn anything about the law. You learn all about what the words that connect the words mean. That's it. A, a little secret that most of you probably know, attorneys are not that smart. <laughs> we just know how to read good, mostly. We don't know how to speak good, or I wouldn't have said that like that. Um, the conservator goes through the steps, who the people are, what they're protecting. They're protecting the interests of the disabled adult. That it's put into, a, uh, into one document. So that if there's questions later down the road, your, your son's 25 years old and you need to take him for medical care, you got to have that that letter of conservatorship with you and go, I have rights to make decisions in these areas. You give them the letter, they go, cool. You sign a form, you're able to consent to treatment and things like that. Or if they want to go to a group home, you have that ability to contract for them to go into that group home. Um, again, the, the, the type of conservatorship special type, the limited conservatorship. Um, and a, a more succinct way of putting it is, is that uh, this is when a judge appoints a responsible person called the conservator, you guys, to assist an adult with developmental disability, your children, who is unable to provide for his or her own personal and or financial needs. Here are the seven areas that a probate judge can grant or limit. Is there anything on there that, that surprises you guys? You can't see? Okay. Let's see if we can make this. That made it worse. That didn't help, did it? I'll read it to you. How about that? Uh, the first one is fix the conservatee's residence or dwelling. That one's kind of given. If they can't make a decision and 
they need to be in a group home or they need to live with you or they need to live with Uncle Bob, you can weigh in and say this is where they need to live. The second is, is to access the conservatives confidential records or papers. So you would still keep track of their social security card, their birth certificate, their letter of conservatorship, diploma, what have you regarding them, their medical records and things like that. Consent or withhold consent to marriage on behalf of the conservative. There, there is some, there, there is some, uh, some case law on that. You can't get a dowry. You're not, you, you, you're not able to get a dowry out of the thing. But um, it's just to help them understand that if someone has ill intentions and they're just going to be there because they know that the conservator gets a check every month. And all they have to do is sit at home and they can eat Twinkies and play Xbox all day. They can do that. So that's where you step in. But this is a typically one that the courts are very cautious about handing out as well. Um, four is to enter into contracts on behalf of the conservatee. So if you have a child who is able to drive, and they want to buy a new car, and they've got the means to do that, but they don't have the know-how and understand. Well, they probably should just hand that out for all adults, too. Uh, I was in the car business for 10 years, and there's some messed up stuff that happens there. Um, but you can help them with those contracts. Or even if they want to go sign up for a, a smartphone, you know, you go to Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T or whatever, what have you, you go in and make sure that they're not getting hoodwinked. They're not going to get hammered on the terms. I'm sorry, guys. He, he's going to be on his own uh, on school. Letter. He can still go, he's over 18, go on, sign up for a smartphone. How would the Verizon people know that they need to call me for me to, to okay that? So when you find out that he went in and he got a smartphone, you go in with the paper and you go, I don't want to be a jerk about this. Yeah, it's a legally binding document. You go, I'm not here to mess things up, but technically you need to put me on this account because I'm his conservator. I know he doesn't look like he needs help, but this document says that he or she does. Repeat the, the oh, example. Sorry. The, the question was is whether, uh, whether or not the people at T-Mobile or AT&T, how are they going to know that the, the, the adult, the disabled adult is, is uh, a conservative? And typically they're not going to because we all know our kids, unless it's readily apparent and they're hopping and they're bouncing and they're doing all of their things, they're not going to know because they'll be able to have a conversation and there'll be little things and the salesperson is going to go, great, I'm selling phone. And it's probably not out of ill will. It's just that's what they do for a living. Then you go back in and you take the, the letter of conservatorship. So I have a question. So if Roxanne, if can you get the mic, please? <laughs> the audience member is now laughing. She's having a great time. So if you didn't want them to have that code and you went back, do they have to then the contract that they signed becomes no good? The the, the question was is if if you feel as a conservator, it's not in the best interest of the conservatee to have contracted for that phone, can you go and invalidate the contract? And that depends on how much authority the, the probate judge gave in that letter of conservatorship. And it'll be pretty clear 
whether or not, and if so, you walk in and you go, I'm really sorry. I'll always be nice. Always err on the side of caution and on the side of making, keeping friends. Um, because you, you don't want to be that person that walks into AT&T and you're throwing stuff and you're yelling and you're calling every bad name in the book and every time they see an autistic person, they're like, they are jerks. They're all jerks. I don't want to deal with them. So just keep that in mind. You go in and you, you know, quietly talk to them. I know you didn't understand. I'm assuming you didn't understand. Whatever. He doesn't have that capability. He doesn't have the capacity to contract with you because the judge has found them in, incapable to do so. I'm here just to help with that. And, and have, have I seen that? Yeah, I've seen that. Have I seen the other version where they go in and they're throwing stuff? Yeah, I've seen that, those parents too. And I and honestly, I just keep my distance from them because they're a liability on lots of fronts. Um, number five, uh, give or withhold medical consent on behalf of the conservatee. So the example that I gave earlier about, you know, you're going to the hospital and they need a cyst removed out of their neck. Some of them are going to get, yeah, I've got this cyst that's in my neck, I need to take it out. Some of them are going to be like, okay. When you said neck, that's when I quit listening because I wasn't able to process it. That's why you step in and you go, they don't understand this, but it needs to be done. Go ahead. Take the paper, sign the paper, and you move on. Um, number six is also another one of those very touchy areas. It is that the, the conservator selects the conservatee's social and sexual contacts and relationships. That one always makes the room really quiet. It's a little... Why do you guys think that would be? You guys have been quiet over there. Because the people that are coming to their lives are trying to take advantage of them and don't do opposite That happens. It's not bad. It happens. And, and unfortunately, it happens all too often. All you have to do is watch the news. I don't recommend watching the news, but... All you got to do is watch the news. There's always something in there about it. That's at the base of this, this mechanism, these conservatorships, is to protect the vulnerable, the vulnerable members of our society that, that we care about, us here, um, and the more awareness that we have and the understanding we have, we can share that with others, and they'll be able to have that same awareness and hopefully step up when it's the when it's necessary. Um, and the last one, uh, seven, uh, like Erlinda has done uh, with with her son, is they've enrolled him. And uh, the sharps, right? Have enrolled enrolled your daughter, son, son in in uh, Imperial Valley College. You made an educational decision for that child or with that child. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can't handle it. Uh, I loved what Linda said earlier. She said, he's taking two classes, maybe we'll add one. And um, Linda was explaining that, that really enjoyed the music class that he was taking and he wanted to take another music class. So that is the perfect example of how a conservatorship is supposed to work because there's a collaboration. You have the conservatee going to the conservator. He's developing those social skills. He's developing how to, let's go back here. He's developing the ability to make adult decisions independently. 
because taking those classes really is an adult decision. Because that's how he's going to spend his time. That's how he's going to spend his money. That's how, what he wants to do to develop himself. And if you got dizzy in that, don't ride roller coasters, okay? Um, and again, small print on purpose. <laughs> um, who's the conservative? In our in, in in this group, in this crew, the the person with autism. Um, person with a developmental disability and that actually there's a statute, there's a law that defines what that is and who decides that is the regional center, whether they have a developmental disability. That's a whole separate issue that if a lot of times parents believe that their child has a developmental disability and regional centers like, oh no, and then you go and appeal it and you get them to go Seriously, here's what the doctor said. Seriously, here's what the psychologist said. And you prove up that case so that your child can, can take uh, advantage and not in a bad way of the benefits that are set there in, in the social world. Um, and we've covered this kind of ad nauseum already. Why, why um, you guys know why they would need a limited conservatorship? They're susceptible. They don't have the processes. But as time goes on, they're good at routine. If you can keep that routine going, maybe they'll pick some up and maybe they won't. But you'll be there as a safety net. So really, uh, Jose, you, uh, you mentioned earlier that your child is 17, and you also mentioned that it's about time to get started with this thing. What what leads you to that that point? What's your thought process that took you there? Well, she's nonverbal. She cannot make decisions on her own. She's aggressive at times, and so that led me to let us to think that it's time, she's going to turn 18, so it's time for us to to build a petition or application for conservatorship. That's why. Right. I love the fact that you, um, you explain certain points in there. That she's 17 and she'll sco soon be 18. That's the biggest point. When? When will that proposed conservative become 18? Because that's where either they're going to have all the rights or they're going to have shared rights or very limited rights with you. And then you talked about that she's nonverbal and aggressive and, and so on. Um, I'm assuming that she already received services through regional center? Uh, she, well, actually, she doesn't receive services through regional center. But we get respite, but that's, that's what we get. Well. That, that is a service, so you're, you're in regional center. You nailed it. Um, and then you talked about she needs some, well, it could be inferred from what you said that she needs a high level of care and supervision. Exactly. And, and that is one of the, the big pieces, and you have evidence of that through IEPs, school records, medical records, um, those community interactions you could actually have documentation from organizations uh, like the Auti Autism Support of Imperial County. You could get letters from people here, observations of behavior, things like that. Um, church, uh, sports teams, if that's something your child does. All those kinds of things that supports what kind of level of care they need. Um, but by and large, the two biggest are going to be your regional center services and most of the time IEP and I do roll my eyes because 
the biggest part of my law practice is special education. And sometimes it takes years to get the school districts to go, oh yeah. So that's what's been wrong for the last eight years. Um, and then one thing that, that I've noticed a lot of people don't realize is there's a notice component. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time on, on this point. When you file a petition for conservatorship, you have to file that petition on all family members. Aunts, uncles, grandparents, siblings, people that are in their life. Because they have to have an opportunity to say, mom's crazy, she does all this stuff, and we don't think she's good. Because, or, or dad's crazy, because dad's, I got stories about dads. <laughs> but they want to make sure, and they have to be, they, the court, has to be thorough. And they want everyone to have a voice in the decision because it is a community decision. And that community is your family and those people that are close to you. Um, and hopefully that's the situation where you do have that support and that family around you. Um, so you have to think, is there anybody in there that might oppose you becoming a conservator of this, this child who would become an adult. That's uh, a big piece because that's going to determine how the petition process goes along. So is there somebody in your family that says, okay, you know, I don't think she should be, but do they name somebody? Or I mean, if they, well, if they just say no, she shouldn't be, what, what happens then? So what, what do you think would happen? Say, say your daughter goes, it's Roxana, right? They're, Rosanna. They're like, mm, Rosanna, no pues está así. What do you think happens? They just, they won't give it to you at all? You have a court investigator. That's why. Because they might just be mad because you didn't you had a girls you had a girls night out and didn't invite them. And they're like, mm, I'm gonna show you. So they have to bring in that reasonableness. They have to go, okay. Why is this person saying this? Is there an actual issue there that we need to address? That's why you have this court investigator and this probate judge, because they're third party. And if they're not third party, you need to raise your hand and say, we need someone else. And you have that right. And that's a big piece of what if, and I highly suggest getting it set up correctly with an attorney the first time, because I've seen them come back and it's like, why didn't you say anything? Well, we didn't think we could. So have your attorney go, hey, no, these people are not the people to do this job, and this is why. Okay. Uh, the other one, if I'm more I'm trying to understand this scenario, what if the, uh, a member of the family doesn't believe that the child, like I said, my son is very high functioning. What if the, the, his mother says, no, he doesn't need a, um, a conservatorship? So the question is, is what happens if a, a family member feels that the, the child who will become an adult doesn't need to be conserved or become a conservatee? That's not up to, the, to that person. The court investigator, regional center, all the information they gather, that's where the decision's made. And the judge is gonna defer or take the, the recommendation of the court investigator with what's called the high level of deference. They're gonna go, you spent some time with this kid, you spent some time with the family, you should know the situation. And they, they do 
believe it or not, even if they spend like two or three hours with you, they've spent hours with other people making sure that this is safe because if they don't, the state's on the hook for the liability because they signed off on it. It's like giving a blind person a driver's license. They're not going to do that because they're like, you can't see, you can't drive. You'd be hitting people. That's why they, they take all these steps and it feels so arduous. And you're like, I've been, I've been his mom, I've been his dad for 17 and a half, three quarter years. Why can't we just move forward? They need to make sure. So the answer to your question is they can, they can say that the kid doesn't need it. Knock yourself out. And you probably just knocked yourself out of ever being in contention of being a conservator. Because the court takes note of that. So if you have a family member that wants to do that, I'm being recorded. I was going to do, I was going to be a little naughty. Let them do it. Because then they don't get to play. You're like, oh, sorry. Did this to yourself. Sorry, bro. Um, but that, that comes as a surprise to a lot of people when they go to set up their conservatorship. Now we kind of put everything together. And again, small letters on purpose um, because that's the nature of, of law. Because there's a lot of fine print. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff crammed into a paragraph, and you're like, they hand us, well, they don't hand us, we earn a law license because we read one paragraph, and we take from one paragraph and we write four or five pages of information of what happened in one paragraph. So the reason why they test us that way is because that's what the law does. Um, so essentially, this lays out uh, in an action-packed way that process. But here's a, a little easier way to digest it. This breaks down, and I'll read these because I realize it's probably not as clear. Uh, the first step is you file the petition. And you're going to file that along with supporting documents. And you file that in the probate court. And a lot of people go, what is probate? Isn't that where people die? And you go to probate court to contest the will or fight over someone's will or trust? Yeah, it is. But the reason why it's in probate court is because you're interested in that person's well-being. So when someone dies, they've laid out, this is the way I want things to go. Or if they haven't laid it out, the state has a way to, to lay it out. There's a, there's a state plain vanilla plan for you. We go to probate court because you're looking at the interests of the person and protecting those interests. You don't go to civil court because you're not arguing over something that happened wrong. You don't go to criminal court because they didn't commit a wrong against the people. You go to probate court because it's their interest and their life. Okay, good. I didn't want to be that teacher. Do you have something to share with the class? <laughs> What's that? Probably, probably not for free, unless you have a really nice friend that will pay for it for you. Oops. See, you got me so excited. You got me nervous right now. The child will get one for free, right? Is that what it is? The, 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 the parent is the one that has to pay for their part. The, the proposed conservator, the child who will become an adult, the court will provide... Uh, appointed counsel for them if if you qualify um, and, and we'll get to that we'll get to that money piece but I'm not going to do it on camera um, just just for various reasons 
Uh, and I'll explain to you. I may as well just explain it now. Um, just like with uh, the special education cases that I do, I don't take anything up front from anybody because that education is a constitutionally protected right. Once you qualify and they determine that the disability that the child qualifies for, they're entitled to a free appropriate public education. And free means that you shouldn't have to pay for an attorney to fight for you. I will sometimes ask for help with my administrative costs and my material costs. Um, 200 bucks to 500 bucks, depending. You know, 500 was because I, I traveled to Utah to help a family. Um, if it's the difference of me coaching you to how to do this and you getting it done or you not doing it because you're afraid to do it, I'm going to coach you. And you'll make me tamales or cookies or wash my car or whatever. Because honestly, this is not, I, I make my living at this, but I don't make my living on one, one client. Um, because if I do that, you're going to tell other people, this is this guy. Don't tell him you got it for free, though. <laughs> but I, I'm not, if I, was, if I was in this for money, I, I really got in the wrong area of law. Um, after you file the paperwork and you do all that stuff, you wait for the probate court to assign a court investigator because they assign it. You don't go in and go, well, we don't want Maria. We want Jerry. Jerry likes us and hates my ex-wife. <laughs> That's why the court appoints them because they're third party. Um, and then the court investigator comes in and, and interviews you, interviews the child, talks to regional center representative, goes to, to the IEP team, talks to therapists, talks to behavior services, all of these places to get all that information together. And then either an attorney's hired or appointed by the court for the child who will become an adult. Uh, and the way we do this, again, is there's a, there's a fee waiver. You just show them, here's uh, the child doesn't have any assets. This is what we got. And they, they're pretty liberal on waiving the attorney, appointing a, an attorney for the conservative. Um, and then regional, regional centers involved in that evaluation, and they make sure there's no assessments that were missed so that they can make sure that the judge has all the information. So if your kid hasn't had uh, a psychoeducational or neuropsychological or some psychological evaluation in six years because your school district's like, ah, just sign this paper. You don't, need, you don't need to do that evaluation. We know about your kid. Then the regional center is going to go, well, we need to test that because it's been a while. So they'll add more information into that, into that pot of, of uh, information. Once you do all that, the two attorneys, parents or the parents, the conservatives attorney, the court investigator, possibly the, the regional center representative and the judge are in the courtroom. And the judge looks over the paper and, and it'll feel like the judge has never looked at it before. <laughs> the first time I witnessed it, I'm like, dude, did you even look at this? Because the judge was like, <laughs> and afterwards, me being me, I walked up and I said, "Excuse me, ma'am," and I wasn't even an attorney. Then. Excuse me, ma'am. Did you read this beforehand? She goes, "Yeah, I just had to remember it." I'm like, "Oh, okay." But it feels weird, and, and because the emotions are high, you have to remember that these judges see hundreds of these. 
and, and other things in between where people are fighting over estates and fighting over who's going to take care of grandma and all these things. So it's going to, a lot of times it'll feel a little impersonal when you get in that courtroom and they're like, mm. So just keep that in mind. Once the, the, the judge will have some conversation with you, he'll say, well, tell me a little bit about yourself, the situation where you're at. I see here in the report this. They'll want to talk to your child. Um, they'll get some information. They'll get a feel. And they're really good at it. They're really good at it. They know the questions to ask to get right to the meat of the matter. They'll ask the investigators some questions. They'll ask the attorneys questions, typically at the end. And if there's no objections, uh, within a few days you'll have a uh, letter of conservatorship. And that's the letter you take when you go to the hospital or you go to T-Mobile or you go to wherever it is, sign up for school so that you get notification of any of those changes or any anything. Um, once you get that letter, keep it somewhere safe. Take one of these, take a picture of it. You'll have it with you all the time. So there isn't anybody in here. Everybody got one of these? Anybody not have one of these? Okay. Take a picture. Keep it with you all the time. Because um, you never know when you'll need it. So then you're done. Right? Go ahead. Okay, I got one quick question. Um, what are the legal repercussions or liabilities of a person that takes over like, like a parent, for example. It's, you mentioned earlier, like, like a child, like, if somebody wants to get a driver's license. If he's capable and he's a good driver and I sign for it, I authorize it, and he gets caught for it in an accident, am I the person liable for it? What's the story there? How does it go? Do they give him an actual uh, uh, known to be in the spectrum? So, being on the spectrum won't um, preclude you from getting a driver's license. My, my oldest son is on the spectrum. Um, and he drives a Dodge Charger. And he probably drives it a lot faster than he should. Just in case you're watching, David. Because it's really loud and he likes the way it sounds. The decision, the decision to give them a license is to, on the state. If they can pass the test and an insurance company is going to give them insurance, it's on the state and the insurance company. Insurance, That's company. insurance company can't deny him just because he has a disability. Right. And if they do, and if the insurance company, James Gonzalez, would never, ever, ever do that, but if someone in the same industry as James Gonzalez denies the insurance, I'll have my number at the end of this thing. I've got several friends that would love that case. <laughs> love that case. Um, so that's it. Except for it really isn't done. After you're done, you're not done. Ray said they come back and they check on you. Oh, yes, they check on you. Um, within 30 days, you have a responsibility, if your attorney hasn't helped you already, to serve the other people that you served notice that you were petitioning for conservatorship. Now you get to tell them that you got made the, con the conservator. So if they're like, oh, he's no good, you go, oh, guess what? The, ch the court said I'm that good. So you get to give everybody the notice. Um, and you can't send two to ex-wives or ex-husbands, just one. Uh, within 60 days, you need to file with the, the probate court a care plan. It lays out what, they, uh, what their needs are, what you've done to plan for it, their financial needs, their living needs, education, all those kinds of things. You write a nice letter. Have your attorney help you because... They probably have one where they just plug in words already made. 
And then, uh, at the end of the first year, the investigator comes back and he visits with you and visits with, with uh, your adult child to make sure everything's kosher. And they, and they may talk to other people around too just to make sure they're not missing anything. And then probably every year after that, I do know someone who, for the first three years, it was every six months because they were, there was a lot of behavior issues and they wanted to make they were sure they were safe. I've heard of every three months. And a lot of people go, well, why are they in my business? They're in your business because they need to protect both of you. And we as parents want to be super parents and we're like, no, I got this. And the next thing you know, you're walking around the, the market in a turtleneck in summer because your autistic kid manhandled you, punched you in the neck. They need to make sure everybody's safe. And if they need to intervene, then they need to intervene and bring some help in. That's why they do these investigations. So that's it. Uh, the question is, when is it too late to get a conservatorship? If you're dead, it's too late. But up until then, grab one. Yeah, you can you can do it any time. It's recommended to do it as they turn 18. But the good thing is, if you have waited, then you have some track record, and that care plan. Super simple. And that is a good. So what Ray's saying is, in in his particular situation, his son is in a group home. And when he needs procedures done medically, the group home still goes to Ray and goes, hey, can we do this? And Ray's going, it just doesn't seem right. And you're right. Either they need to have those rights or you need to have those rights. But someone needs to have those legal rights for your son because he's nonverbal, because he doesn't have that communication skill. Other questions? I would recommend going yeah, revisiting three days, regional center. Three days, a letter from Reed, I know that. So yeah. Right. So we need to go back to regional and start there before we do anything else, right? Right. So you go to regional center, and if they deny you, then call me. Call me. Um, you you've got two or three more if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, like I said, in some cases of high functioning children. Um, is it possible that after a while of the child being an adult, we come to our senses and realize that maybe he can handle it? Can, can it be discarded afterwards, I'm guessing by the judge, or we need to go to court again? How does it work? So what happens is if, if the, the court investigator is like, hey, this kid seems like this, your adult child, seems like they're doing everything really good. They'll petition to have another investigation done. And, and, it, and this could happen step by step. They're like, well, you know, they're like able to write checks and they're doing all these things, so maybe we should loosen that up. You go back to the court, and the court, either on its own initiative, or you go back and you petition the court, they'll change and modify that, that uh, conservatorship, the letter of conservatorship. So, yeah. So, so do you have, a, like, what area can you, because I heard you talk about medical, and, and I mentioned, like, what area can you see a conservator? Was it the seven working on that? Yeah, the seven. yeah it, you just couldn't see it because <laughs> I tried.
I tried making it really big. I am technically challenged. Just, I should probably go to my kids' school and ask for an IEP for technology. Oh, okay. So these are those seven areas where they can limit it. The, the question I asked Linda earlier was, does your son have his voting rights? And, and she told me, yep, the last time they gave them to him. That's a big, that's a big one that they give to almost all conservators is the right to vote. That's almost an automatic. You have to be like way, 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 way at the at the very extreme end to not have your voting rights, especially after a little bit of time. So she, Linda's saying that the investigator came and spoke to them last September and talked to him. Go ahead. So what, what she said is the investigator came and, and Sorry, I turned it up to hear her. Talked to, talked to Carlos and asked him about the president, asked him, probably asked him, do you watch the news? Do you understand these situations? Uh, do you know what the difference between a Republican and a Democrat is? And if he asked what he was, then he was not doing good. Um, <laughs> but they asked these questions because this is what they do. Like some people fix cars and some people do concrete. Some people build houses. Some people drive for a living. This is what these court investigators do every single day. I know you mentioned you can have the conservator and a co-conservator. Is there a limit on how many co-conservators can you have? Uh, I wanna, for my example, would it be a sibling? And say mom and dad are still alive, obviously if one passes, then that helps the sibling also assist. Mm. Is there a limit? Conceivably, you could have as many as you want, but when you go to court, the judge is gonna be like, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And between you three, there's probably going to be some disagreement. Who are the real decision makers? And, they, and they, they won't counsel you, but if you have an attorney, they'll be like, what we need to do is we need to set up a really quick will that just says, if either one of us pass away, this person becomes the co-conservator. So it's just, there's a lot of these, these moving parts in there, and that's, that's why, why the investment of, of Hiring an attorney to help you with it is is really important because there's lots of things um, that even we we don't think of. You know, I'm on the phone with other attorneys that do the same thing. I'm like, okay, here's where I'm at. What do you think? And they're like, didn't you think about this? I'm like, oh. you know, because they want to make you feel like a noob, and that's just it's everywhere. Everybody wants to haze you a little bit. But we, I have people I call on um, in all areas of, of my practice. Um, the firm that I interned with through law school, I still call them up. I called them today, uh, not, not about a legal issue. I thought I didn't have the right fax number because the school district wasn't receiving my the complaint school district finally called me back. Not that you guys know anything about school districts not calling you back. And they're like, oh no, uh, someone must have turned off the fax machine. I'm like, seriously, you still use a fax machine? Get e-fax or something, yeah? So, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, other questions? Yes, I'm in. No, I prove it to none, none. I, I, I always
always need a client, Ray. I'd be honored. I have some business cards. I don't bring a lot of papers because, as you can tell, I like the interaction. Uh, I would rather have you interact. So the question is, is what happens if there's not a conservatorship set up and something happens to the parents? Is there a first right of refusal for someone? The, the answer is, is if that person is an adult and there's no conservatorship in place, then they're going to continue the same because they didn't have that protection in the first place. You could petition at that point to start the process. If both parents were conservators and they both pass away, God forbid that happens, in the same incident, then the court's going to look at who's a good emergency conservator. But you'll still have to go through that investigation and all that. then the parents have those rights. That's why the only reason why you set up a conservatorship is because they're going from being a child. That that is uh, that that falls more under the purview or the or the control of um, child welfare services. And they're typically, and this is not, this is based on personal experience, not in any legal, they're going to look to see is there a, is there a kin or a kinship relationship of someone or some ones that can take care of these children. Um, my wife and I were in a situation where uh, some of the children we adopted, they're, they're family members. Uh, and when both parents weren't able to take care of them any longer, they went, one, who's willing? And two, who's the most capable? And they came to us and they go, are you OK to do this emergency placement at your home? Are you? And we said, of course we are. Because um, as my, my older brother explains, he says, yeah, you, can, you and your and Jackie uh, picking any stray puppies or people. So that's what we did. The, the, the laws vary much about protecting, especially vulnerable children. And they're going to know the grandmas here are, you guys are obviously very involved, or you wouldn't be here with us right now. I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Jimmy, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it, you. as always. So, um, that, that concludes the meeting for tonight. Um, again, if you, if you have any questions, Jimmy will make his card available to you guys if you have any more questions that are more directed to him. Um, I'm sure he has an email, and I'm sure he has an e-fax. Um, um, again, remember, uh, going back, the golf tournament on May 5th, yes, Ray has set up a golf tournament for Cinco de Mayo. He said he's wearing his special hat. What that means, I don't know, but uh, he will be doing that. Um, if you need any more information, it is on our Facebook page. We'll be setting up our website shortly with the information. So um, please make sure to do that. If you're interested in participating, get a hold of Ray right away. His contact number is there. If you want to be a sponsor, get a hold of Ray. His contact number is there. If you want to give Ray money, get a hold of Ray. His number is right there. I, again, this is, uh, this is all this is all for um, the community of the Imperial County with uh, Manchester Leeds. Um, we support community um, 
We also need uh, raffle prizes or anything else that you are willing to donate for anything. Uh, so again, whatever you can do, please let us know. Having said that, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, we'll just set up all the chairs, have the walls, the tables, just please leave them alone. Thank you everybody for, for coming by. Um, Jimmy, again, thank you for, for helping us out. Right. Dana, you're on camera.